right, I guess I'll start it off. <clears throat> I'm Bill Mench. Uh, I guess you can see that on the screen. And then Stephen Edwards. Uh, hi, Stephen. Hello. Uh, what I was thinking we would do here, Stephen and I have talked and have recorded various sessions over the last few years. Stephen is a tenured professor of computer science at Columbia University. Uh, and I, he and I have spent many hours talking about things. Recently, I saw a Facebook posting where he claims I said, I told, I called him the geekiest professor I know, which is factually correct. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, Stephen put together some slides to guide our conversation. So we're used to having conversations like this because Stephen kind of uh, inspires interesting information from the past, some of the future. And so I thought, well, Stephen and I, let's do another one of these at Kansas Fest. I should make a note here that, uh, you know, I don't, are we going to have a, a moderated uh, questions? Because I, I'm kind of a klutz at finding the questions and reading the questions while I'm trying to talk. But in any event, um, I did, I did, uh, identify this or describe this as uh, for the 6502, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And uh, as we go through these slides, uh, we'll pull up some of that yesterday, today, and tomorrow about the 6502 technology. But I also uh, would like to tie it into yesterday, today, and tomorrow about the Apple II. And I think we have some slides that uh, Stephen had, will will present some of the uh, discussion on those points. Okay, Stephen, uh, do we wanna try another slide? Yep, absolutely. Oh, and I think I managed to find the right uh, uh, Discord uh, servers. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll pass questions along as I, uh, as I see them. At the moment, it just seems to be uh, you know, accolades and uh, appreciation and so forth. Although uh, people apparently like the 6502 tomorrow. It, it ain't going anywhere, it's, it's, it's sticking around. <laughs> Exactly. It's not going anywhere. It's been around. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I want well, to let's let's talk that. about how it started. So, OK, uh, 1974 okay. is a uh, reasonably good starting year. And uh, this this, I understand, is the team that uh, put the 6502 together. Yeah, that's, that's correct, Stephen. And uh, you can see the various. Uh, positions, responsibilities under each of those people. And so then you can see where I'm a, actually a semiconductor design engineer and Rod Orgel is as well. He's to my left in the picture to my right. But yeah, it was a, that was a great group, fun team. Yeah, so we absolutely. did we did have a, a MOS technology with uh, pictured there is John Pavin and the president. He was a friend of Chuck Peddles from his GE computer days, and uh, Walt Eisenhower, he was the process engineering manager. Both of them were highly skilled at process development, and then uh, John Pavin, and he was involved actually in process development as well. And then Terry Holt was involved with process development coming from Motorola. And uh, so actually, uh, there's more to tell about that story, but uh, let's move on then. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, uh, Moss uh, Technologies was, uh, 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 oh, somebody was asking, where was Moss Tech located? Okay, it was located in Valley Forge Corporate Center, which on their, on their documentation, it says Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, but it was really Norristown, Pennsylvania. But <laughs> hey, uh, Valley Forge sounds better, right? If you're going to create a re revolution, why not come from Valley absolutely. Forge. And the place was absolutely rolling in money. You, you had all the things at your disposal. Is that, is that how it went? Yeah, right. Now, Motorola had all the money. You know, at the time, Motorola was the second largest semiconductor company in the world, follow, following Texas Instruments. But Intel wasn't even really on the scene. And uh, I, I, they were probably losing money when we were making this chip. But anyhow, the... Uh, uh, it was a very low budget place. And in fact, 
we did everything. We wrote the data sheets, we did everything. And uh, that little tester there, that's the tester that uh, you see the little black button next to the 6502 that's plugged in there. It's the uh, kind of a purple ceramic right there. That button was the start button for testing. Each time uh, you wanted to test a chip, you plug the chip in there and then you push that button. The test program was actually loaded into those two stacks of, uh, that's page zero and page one. So I put the, the test program into that memory and I loaded it. Uh, you see the white ceramic, that's a 6530 TIM teletype input monitor. You can just see a corner of the actual connector that went to the ASR33. And so I would load the, uh, the program from paper tape reader on the ASR33. And then, uh, then I, once it's loaded, then I have some protection, a protection switch on there for the memory protection. And then uh, I would see the, on those, those LEDs there that you see in there, that's the address buses on those four, first four, and the one, two on the right is the data bus. So the operator was trained. So she, she usually it's a woman at, at MOS Technology it was. Uh, anyhow, the, the tester uh, would see that the address was correct when it completed uh, the test and it would print out results also. I would print out results from each chip on the teletype. Uh, so then uh, anyhow, so that, that's how I did the microprocessor. So the first one would be, uh, the first one used, the first microprocessor was used to load the program. If something went wrong with the program for the next one, it'd just have to be reloaded. But anyhow, I did that with, had little load boards for the 22, 21, 51, had load boards for everything there. And that was kind of a fun thing. Now you can see the dial on the right there. Uh, it could change the frequency. So if I was going to, uh, if we were selling two megahertz chips, uh, we'd run them at four. If we were selling one megahertz chip, we'd, we'd test them at two. But anyhow, we never sent in, sold anything less than uh, one megahertz. And I think that's just in the spec because that's what Intel and Motorola could only do one or two megahertz at that point, but we could do four. Actually that tester, that, that RAM right there was ECL RAM. Uh, and I, I put them on top of each other to lower the capacitance. And uh, I, if, you, if I took that apart, took the bottom off it, you could see the power, power routing that I did. Now, for those that don't know, I was a technician before I was an engineer. So I worked at Philco Ford in an advanced semiconductor lab. So actually I built that, that, I designed and built that tester in two weeks because we didn't have any tester. We had chips, but no tester. <laughs> and so I had to quick put together a tester that was replaced after two and a half years with a uh, about $750,000 Century, uh, Fairchild Century system. Okay, Stephen, we might, might wanna move on unless there's a question about that. Yep, no, I think you've uh, uh, proven your bona fides. This, this was probably the fastest 6502 with the fastest memory at the at the time. Yeah, that ran at 10 megahertz actually. I had chips that were double implanted and I plugged it in that same socket there and it ran at 10 megahertz. I yeah, 10 megahertz. We we, we need a much bigger 6502 overclocking group uh, in in this world. I'm, I'm convinced now. <laughs> There's some people you know that have run the, my my current 65 CO2s at 30 30 30 to 40 megahertz. Wow, impressive. So here's the 6502 die. Um, uh, what I'm struck by, first of all, you seem to know every one of these transistors personally. Um, secondly, uh, there's quite a lot of structure here that you can actually, you can actually see and, and understand fairly well. You wanna, you wanna take us through uh, uh, a, a tour here? So I'm seeing this structure down here, for example. What, what is this? We'll call that. I called that the register section, but for some, you would think of it as the data path. On the right side, there is the address uh, of the data bus. And so uh, you're bringing information from an external memory in through the data bus. And then the various registers are lined up there on the going to the left. And on the very the far, far left is the address low bus. And the bottom, uh, 
buff, those at the bottom is the address high bus. So you can see how we could set it up so zero page addressing, uh, you just put out the address on the low bus and the high bus uh, is zero. Uh, so therefore, that was a really quick path. And that's one of the, whatever, that's one of the reasons why the 6502 was used and was fastest processor of its day. So, so when you design a chip, this is part of what uh, I am going to be making available for education purposes, all of my proprietary information through universities. So we're setting that up now. So actually I have a professor that, that has started writing a textbook that would include this. I'm also uh, going to be providing the information on how I designed this NMOS 6502, the NMOS and CMOS. So when you, you don't have a chip, you know, you're just talking about it and then Chuck and Will and Rod are trying to figure out uh, what addressing modes and what uh, opcodes we're gonna have, what instructions we're gonna have and the different addressing modes. So we don't have a chip. This is August 19, 1974. We do not have a chip. So this layout here is you got to create that. So we had two layout designers. That was Mike James and Harry Balkum. And then we added Sid uh, Holt to the, the team. She was back in, I think, Princeton at the time, um, not the university, but lived in Princeton. I think she also may have worked at Bell Labs. Uh, there's some information on the team6502.org. Uh, there's some really good information. I can't tell you how much I like promoting that. Uh, if we had time, I would like to pl plug uh, that, that website. Jennifer Holt Winograd created that and she's the voiceover. So that's a wonderful one to get some more information about the, the NMOS 6502. But uh, Ted, uh, Ted uh, Stephen, if you'd go back to that other picture of the 6502. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't have a chip. So you start looking at where you're going to put some pins. Now, actually, we had a pinout, and it was a 6800. So we already knew the pinout. And the 6501 was totally loyal to the not only the pinout, but the, the voltages, it was TTL, and uh, all of that. So we have to build a 6502 that pins out, that has the pinout and package type of the 6800. So you can see where the actual locations of some of these came from, it would be the 6800. So then we started putting this together. So then I'm, I'm off getting this uh, data path figured out because we already knew what registers we wanted. We also knew we were gonna have a 16-bit program counter. So we have to have that in there. We have, a, have to have a uh, ALU with the, the normal instructions, but then at some point, Chuck and Will uh, I think it was Chuck that wanted decimal mode, which actually some of our licensees delete the decimal mode because it causes problems. They don't want to do the decimal mode. Uh, but anyhow, all of the registers were lined up. I could do that work while they're trying to get the logic designed for the actual instruction decodes and the timing state. So up above there, if you go up to the uh, what, what some people call the PLA area, that I call on my CMOS uh, design, I call that the min terms for logic. And then the random logic section is between that PLA and the actual uh, register section or the data pad. So that right there had to fit in there. Now, of course, we had fixed by the time the logic was ready to be placed for the top half, we call that the top half also. The bottom half is the, the, the register section. In between the two are the register transfer uh, drivers. So we could, in between the, the random logic there, you'll see some uh, fairly organized, uh, and those are the transfer gates. So that you take the logic with the state, you know, the actual decode of the instruction with the timing state, and then you feed that into the transfer uh, drivers, and then you open up the outputs of the register that wants to be transferred to, let's say the ALU from, it could be from the, uh, a register or the accumulator, uh, and then you know it's put into the ALU. So there's 
four buses, I think. There's an address bus low, an address bus high, a data bus, and then the left-hand side of that register section has a special bus. And that was needed because, because we needed to uh, hold the stack pointer value while we're updating it. And so there's, there's a lot of transfer going on in there. And that's how we could uh, make the timing that we needed for the various instructions. So we used a minimum number of cycles for everything. That was, a, that was one of the things we did. And if some processor at the time, like the 6800 or the 8080 or the Z80 took more cycles, it's just because they didn't optimize it as much as we did. So now coming back to that, the timing generators on the left side of the PLA, and then the instruction registers on the right side. Around the top is the control bus. So the control bus like, IRQ, NMI, I think NMI might be on the left there. Uh, but then we have the uh, ready and we have the clock inputs. And the clock inputs is another interesting thing to talk about with the chip here. Uh, the upper right hand, uh, there's some pads up there and one of them is phase two. Then there's phase one, if you're gonna be compatible with the 6800. So we had both phase one and phase two coming into the chip for the 6800 compatibility. If you look at the Apple One, you'll see that Wozniak designed the Apple One to either accept the 6800 or the 6502, but he doesn't say 6501 on his schematic and his design. So actually, Wozniak was covering his bases. He wanted to turn out an Apple One, and even if MOS would blow away, he had 6800s and I think he probably realized, or somebody told him, hey, you know what? You do that with six, the second largest semiconductor company in the world, you're going to get sued. And we did. <laughs> we did, individually and collectively. And why did we get sued? The same time we're designing this chip, we're actually signing the patents over to Motorola that we're using. And then we can't tell the judge, oh, sir, we didn't use our patents. Well, we did, we're signing them and we're using them. And so that's an interesting story. There's a tidbit. I actually paid back all of my, all of every dollar that I received in salary from Motorola because I cross-licensed Motorola at some point when I had my own company, not at, Motorola, not at MOS. But what I did was paid back more than twice what I earned as, a, as an employee at Motorola in a cross-license agreement I had with Motorola later. Okay, so is there any questions or uh, Steve? No, I think, I, I think we ought to move on. Um, okay. you, had, you had made a bet about the 6501 versus 6502 uh, success with somebody, right? And you, you won that bet? Yeah, Rod and I, we shared tobacco. We, we used to smoke pipes and we smoked cigars and the normal suspects. But anyhow, Rod and I would, we're waiting for about two weeks from the time we said, we're good, it's good to go. We signed off on it. We're gonna build these chips. Ah, you take a deep breath. It's almost like being in the waiting room, waiting for a baby to be born, you know? And I had actually three weeks after the 6502 was released, uh, my second daughter was born on October 4th. But going back to the bet, so Rod and I are just, we don't have anything to do except be a little nervous, talk about things, get some coffee, sit in the conference room outside of, on the second floor of the MOS building, just talking about things, talking about our friendship, talking about maybe getting a beer at lunch. Um, but then he says, he says, the 6501, oh, by the way, the 6502 was my idea. It wasn't Chuck's. Chuck was actually disappointed. He comes back from a sales trip and says, uh, I said, hey, how about if we just uh, make a single phase uh, input and we'll build everything on the chip for phase, phase one. That way we only have the one phase in because it, they were selling a two phase clock generator to go with 6,800 for like $69. I don't know where that number came from, but that's the number I remember. Uh, but the clock generator was $69. And so I said, why don't we build it right in? Because everything tracks on the chip everything tracks. So if it's a fast process, everything goes fast. If it's a slow process, everything goes slow. So if we need a two-phase non-overlapping clock, then that's going to be a problem because 
you have to build this so you don't you don't know what speed the process is on the 6800 as an example or the 6501 so what happened was chuck comes back for the sales trip and i say hey uh, what do you think about making a 6502 he says what's that oh, it's it's a two it's a single phase input both phases we don't need two two phases he said well that won't be compatible with 6800 right he said well I, I, that's not a good idea i go well it's already on the chip. <laughs> and so he says, okay, as long as it doesn't cost any yield. He was all about yield and die size. I said, no, it's already on the chip. I think I had Mike James actually design it right in. It was about 12 transistors I hid under the metal. So then Rod's telling me while we're waiting around for the chips actually be coming off the line and test them. Uh, he's saying 6501, I'll sell you 6502. And I go, <laughs> want to make a bet on that? I don't think that's the case. And he says, I said, I think technology wins. And he goes, no, I think marketing wins and sales wins. And we're following the second largest company in the world with their pride, 6,800. We're going to fill those sockets, just plug in the 6,501 and off we'll go. We'll just change the code. Well, we came out. Motorola was upset. They sued us. And they asked us to remove the 6,501. 6501 is gone. 6502 is still in the market. <laughs> I win the bet. Very nice. And you, you said Motorola at the time was selling a clock generator for $69, whereas the 6502, yeah. when it was released, what was it being sold for? You remember? Yeah, 25. And then, of course, because uh, we got a little premium for the clock generator. Uh, we got five dollars, so the sixty-five at one was selling for twenty bucks. Oh. So I actually got five bucks for my clock generator for my twelve transistors. <laughs> <laughs> most expensive twelve transistors in history. Oh, okay, yeah. so I, I, I think most of us uh, uh, know that the the story at least a little bit from there, right? It you know the sixty-five two ended up in the the Apple II and a few other minor computers along the way and so forth. Uh, took over the world, uh, wonderful stuff and so forth. Um, but uh, the next thing I understand is in the in the story, uh, we're skipping ahead quite a bit here to nineteen eighty two. Uh, uh, a fairly nice. Uh, table you had at your home starts factoring into the story pretty well what what what's with that right right that's uh that, that's not the actual table but it was one we couldn't find that actually was the right the real table but it was a game table that uh i i didn't want to have the 816 disturbing my office because we had projects that we needed and deadlines uh because of the licensees that we were working with like gte rockwell ncr etc so what happens is I decide I'm going to do an 816. And so that's the table that I started to design on. And then to go along with that, do you have a picture? Do we, do we have another picture? But so what I did was the 816 was designed on a, on a card table at my home. So I wouldn't disturb the office. And then I pulled one mass designer off the team. We had at the time probably about eight, 10 mass designers. Uh, we trained all of our mass designers. Actually, I trained uh, my wife, uh, Diane. I, I trained three people at the same time. Uh, one was my the mother of my children. And uh, the other one was my current wife. Interesting. Uh, and then there was the uh, a friend of my wife who she met at La Leche League. That's a, a breastfeeding uh, and she was breastfeeding all of our children. But anyhow, the point is, is that uh, her name is Marty Lozano. Uh, my wife was, is now named Ann Randall. But anyhow, the three, I taught the three of them how to do mass design to fulfill my, uh, uh, my responsibilities because I was teaching uh, Xerox how to design microprocessors while Jobs was getting the GUI from Northern California. I was teaching uh, the engineers in Southern California for Xerox, how to design a 16-bit processor. But going back to the table, that, that's where I designed the 816. And then what I did was I went just one mass designer, and that was my sister. Her name is Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, uh, Mensch. And uh, she has a home in Scottsdale these days, and she has another home 
and that's where she lives in New Zealand. But it, she designed the entire 816 by herself. And so that's the only chip ever designed microprocessor that I'm aware of designed by a brother and a sister. Neat stuff, definitely. So um, it ended up in, uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I, I think the Apple II GS is allowed at, at Kansas Fest. Somebody will, somebody will correct me if it isn't, but. Uh, yeah, I've seen some of the presentations with the Apple II. Yeah. Ah, okay. So they're, they're willing to, to confirm its existence. Yeah. So you <laughs> managed to acquire a relatively early uh, iteration of the, the Apple II GS, despite Apple repeatedly saying they were not going to do the, the 60, uh, they were not going to use the 65816, right? Right. Yeah. They, I met with, uh, what was his name? Uh, God. Oh, he was a designer, the head designer of the Apple III. Ah, uh, oh, I just about had it. I'm losing things here, uh, but anyhow, yeah. So, so I met with him, Wendell Sander. Wendell Sander is the guy. He came to my office and we talked. And then later, I went to his new home he was building, and Apple Apple was going great. But what happened was, uh, they kept telling me they're not going to use the 816. I asked Wendell since he did the Apple III. So, what features would you put on a 16-bit O2? Well. I'm not, he, he didn't really recommend any features, uh, but the, the, the idea was that they had their 16-bit processor, which they should have said was a 32-bit processor. 60, 68,000 was mismarketed from the beginning. It's a 32-bit processor with a 16-bit data bus. Now I have my 16-bit processor with an 8-bit data bus. And when I met with, with Apple, uh, they, they said, well, um, thanks for inviting us to add some features to the O2 for a 16 bit, but we, we really were committed to the 68,000. So no, thank you. So I went up there, took schematics and everything. And then they, I remember coming back from there uh, with tears in my eyes, addressing all of my, my, my team there. I can still remember that. Well, they're not going to use it, but we're going to complete it. We're going to do it. And I know it's the right thing to do, even though Apple is not going to use it. And we did that. So then what happens is I think Dan Hillman, if I got the right name, he was in charge of the Apple II X. It was called the Apple II X for a while in the press, but they, they always denied it. And so then that Cortland there, I actually got from, through, from Steve Jobs through somebody on the Mac team because they said, hey, we're using 68,000 on the original Mac, and we, uh, we want you to change some features on the 65C22, CMOS version of the 22, because we have some asynchronous bus problems with the 68,000, but we want to use CMOS 6502, uh, 6522 VIA. So what do you, I did, I said, oh, okay, no problem. So you have the, the mouse interfaces of 22, and the mouse is conflicting with the uh, 22 serial port. So you're just saying you want, to have, you want to be able to have the bus fight, but resolve it without any damage to the 22. Yeah, okay, I can do that. And then they wanted to have all the asynchronous addresses go to zero, address zero, I think it was, so that if you had an unknown address, which the 6502 does not have unknown addresses, but the 68,000 did. So you'd be bouncing all over the place and you would be uh, resetting interrupts inappropriately if you went to a different address. And so I just had, if it wasn't selected, I would go to register zero. So those were the two little mods that I still sell the same mods in all of my chips. But anyhow, so then I make the changes and then everything works fine. <laughs> GTE is the supplying of the ships. And then somebody calls me and says, Hey, we'd like to, what would you like? Because you made the changes for us. I go, no, uh, you, don't, you don't owe me anything. Uh, I just want GTE to be able to supply your chips. They're my favorite licensee. They, you know, I want, they're going to be the first source on the 816. And, and so there's another story about that. But here I am saying, no, you don't owe me anything. I, I want my licensees to have good market with Apple. Okay, so then that was the end of that conversation. This is before the internet, right? 
This is in about 1985, six or something like that. But anyhow, well, no, it might've been actually before, it could have been before the Apple II GF. But what happens is they, they call me back again and say, we really would like to do something for you. I go, okay, I heard about Apple building a couple of hundred Apple II GSs into an Apple II E case and they have it camouflaged as a Portland. I'll take one of those if you have one of those. And that's how I got that Cortland. <laughs> it was payment for a change for the Macintosh to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess the Mac's good for something occasionally. Well, yeah. My son, my daughter, they all use Mac, Apple products. Sure. I don't think I have an Apple product. <laughs> Other than Apple IIs. I got a collection of Apple IIs. Right. Uh, let's see. So yeah, it wasn't always fun and games. Here's a picture of uh, Jean Louis Gasset from uh, 1987. I think we decided was the the year for this. There's a there's an interesting story behind that, right? Yeah. In fact, that ties me into the Apple II developers in Kansas Fest, actually. So here we are. I've already gone to a couple of Kansas Fests. This is back in the day, and and I I, have, I don't remember remember his face. <laughs> But thanks for finding a picture of him, Stephen. I guess that's him. I, I couldn't tell you whether it was him or not. But here we are. I'm with the Apple II developer uh, group, uh, I guess the board of directors or whatever they were called. There were probably you know four to six of them at, at Kansas, uh, at in, what's the name of that? Moscone Center. Uh, anyhow, it was a big convention of Apple II educators. And Jean-Louis Gasset, the chief technology guy for Apple, he's talking about the Macintosh to Apple II people. Well, basically, I think there was probably some booze. We don't want to hear about the Macintosh. We want to hear about the Apple II. We want faster Apple IIs. And I was prepared because I had talked to the developer the leadership. And so then I'm sitting with them and I'm hearing him talk all about, I can't get faster chips. I can't do this. We can't do a faster Apple II. I can't get a faster Apple II GS. And all this, he's just saying, guys, the future is the Macintosh, move over. And then it, there's two microphones set up and I'm sitting there and my blood's boiling because I have brought with me a half a dozen 816s with the test data that proves that they ran at eight megahertz at that time. And he's telling them we can't get faster chips. <laughs> and so what happens is- I have one right here. <laughs> well, yeah, what, what happens is my blood's boiling. I feel the adrenaline flowing. I get up from my seat, which I don't do usually. I mean, this is one of a kind. I go over to the, I see there's two guys standing up at, at the front and Jean-Louis Gasset says, I have time for two more questions. Well, there's two guys up at the mic, everybody else scatters, right? So I'm sitting here, I go up to this, this, the second guy, I bring out one of my 816s, I wonder who he is today. <laughs> but anyhow, I don't know who he was, but I pulled it out, I said, would you take one of these 816s that runs at eight megahertz with the data? Would, could I, would, could, would you exchange this with your place in line? And he goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> He took my chip, sat down. I got the last question that day. And when I said, Jean-Louis, just so you know, right here, eight megahertz chips. I got the data to prove it. If you want to see it, I'd be happy to show it to you. There are faster 816s available, and this proves it. At which point, he went berserk on stage. On stage. I never saw anybody so upset, especially in front of a crowd. He's just... just so upset with me, and I'm thinking, I, I, I went in more or less a mild case of shock. I was, oh my gosh. And so then I went and sat down. And then that was the end of, that was the end of presentation. The developers and I were going to go to a room that was reserved for us. I get to the back of the thing, and there's Jean Louis Gasset swinging his arm. We're going to go outside, and we are. I'm going to punch you in the face. You can't tell me about that. And he is going on and on. And I said, I don't fight. I'm not going to go outside. We're not going to get into a brawl. 
I'm, I'm going up and we're going to talk about Apple too. And he is so pissed. I don't know what happened after that, but we didn't go outside. I wasn't going to get in a fight. So I didn't, I should have given you another picture. It's a picture of a chip, of, of a mug. I think you have it in your collection. It's a mug that I took from, uh, I had a piece of meeting with Jean-Louis Gasset later. And then I was in his office and he was serving coffee. And I took my, I said, do you mind if I take this cup? So I have it in my display case, the peace offering cup. <laughs> <laughs> the Apple II series has always inspired uh, very uh, strong emotions in, in the user community as, as well as the developer community, it would seem. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. That's work. a good segue, yep. Stephen. A good segue. When did you first program your first Apple, Apple II? Well, I was uh, uh, probably 11, something like that. Um, okay. uh, it's the usual story of, of people my age, right? We had Apple IIs in the schools. And of course, I didn't want to do anything uh, in school except program on the Apple II. And so that's, that's what got me started. You know, we were, we were talking about it. In part, it's, it's baby duck syndrome. Right. You know, it's the, you know, you never forget your first microprocessor, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been at it ever since. So that's good to hear. And Stephen, I think that's why we probably are as close to friends as we are. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you were like a Z80 designer or something like that, I don't think I'd be quite so friendly. Yeah, if you wanted to talk about the Z80, I'd go, okay, we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, 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 yeah. We, 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 we better stop that. We're already getting negative comments in the, in the chat here. So, oh, okay. Um, let's see. So, you had this. So, one of the things I want to point out is you're still designing chips and 6502, 65816 compatibles. Uh, let's see. We've got, uh, what is this, 65C265S. Uh, whatever. S eight Q G dash eight. Right. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's an, eye, an, an eye test here. Right. Um, right. This, is the, this is the latest one you designed. Is that right? That Yeah, that's well. It's the last chip as a semiconductor design engineer I designed. Ah, OK. Uh, that uh, that is a 16 bit. That's got an 816 core mm -hmm. and uh, we sell it. For eighteen dollars and sixteen cents, it's one eight sixteen is what it is. <laughs> so that's the price. It's one eight sixteen. Anyhow, but that that chip was designed in about nineteen eighty seven. Now eighty seven. Ah, oh, okay. What what time? Where, where are we now? How many years later is that? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of years later. That that, that is a little that bit is late. my last official full chip design. And so we sell them. You could think of those as collector items, but those wires on the right plug into a USB uh, cable. And I actually have it here. Oh, hey, look at this. This is what, uh, this is the cable. Mm -hmm. This is the cable. Anyway. And so you can buy these cables out at Mauser or someplace, but this is one of the chips. And then uh, this is what I use to teach actually support my eight-year-old granddaughter's computer science fair project at Naperville, Cent uh, no, at Prairie Elementary School uh, when she was eight. But anyhow, this has eight LEDs, so you can play around with it. It has a total of 500 bytes, 500 bytes of SRAM. Uh, many of the bytes are used. There's about 100 bytes available for programming. So I taught her about ASCII code and she, on her science fair project, she had some things on her poster display about ASCII codes. And, and so she had to set up, but uh, nobody was really wanting to ask her questions because <laughs> she knew more than any of the people showing up at the science fair project about how a little microprocessor worked. Yeah. Oh, uh, so uh, this is a nice segue to uh, address one of the questions we're getting in uh, uh, the, the chat here. Um, uh, Mike here asks whether there's any plans to release the 65802 uh, back in a, you know, a DIP40 package. And he's pointing out that he desperately wants to upgrade his, his 2E or 2C or something like that. So Bill, can you uh, ask one of your licensees to uh, you know, start up a, 
you know, run some wafers for us? Yeah, you gave me a great idea. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Uh, we are, I just mentioned that I'm going to actually teach the world how I design the NMOS O2 and the CMOS O2 and the 816, all of my chips. Uh, you could say that's my exit strategy, so everybody will know. We, there's, a, there's a thing in about, uh, about five years ago, no, it was probably 10 years ago, in the uh, archaeology magazine, you can go archaeology magazine 6502 and you'll find an article about their, uh, their using that as a, a chip archaeology project. And so it's visual 6502 and I, visual 6502 went away. Uh, I don't know what happened there. But what I was going to say is that the 802, question for the 802. I will talk with a professor here in Durango, Colorado about taping out 60, 65 802s, but you, it has to be for education. It, it, it can't be for profit. And so this education project, we can get you some 802s. But that means that if you want to, if you have a professor, hey, Stephen, you're a professor. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to talk to you about a tape out project, uh, but I would like to work with somebody at Columbia to tape out a chip. And if it's the 802, uh, you as a professor then can give them a 802. Now, what's interesting about the 802 is you would want to follow the way that we do, do our designs. So all of my designs are manufactured by TSMC. So if you want 40, 802s, you can't sell them, but you can play with them. Find a professor, have them contact me, bill.mench at westerndesigncenter.com, or just get on my website and send me a message. But anyhow, you want an 802? I just figured it out. We'll start a tape out class <laughs> and you can build them. <laughs> There you go. So a little bit of a little bit of request from the, the community here differently, differently. Uh, let's see. There are a bunch of questions on the chat also about um, uh, the, the people love the die photo and wanted to know more about the details and so forth. You mentioned Visual 6502. It looks like that website is still extant. I'm not sure. In any case, they have very high resolution uh, die photos. I mean, they they used uh, really high power, just optical microscopes. It isn't that small uh, where they've been able to extract the, the, the masks basically and so forth. So I, I heavily recommend people who are interested in seeing more detail, go and take a look there. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. An another question uh, that was asked earlier very broadly by Mark the silicon process technology right. that you had access to at MOS. Right. How did that affect the design? Oh. 6502, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, what's interesting about that is we had to bring up the whole darn thing. But what's interesting at Motorola, second largest company, semiconductor company in the world would not run my depletion mask for the test spec, for the process control monitor. So I, I had a lot of detail. There's a lot of details and you're right. It would take 45 minutes to get through all the details. I do have the sequence of things on my website. Uh, it's the Bill Mench 6502 story. You can find that. Uh, there's about 38 slides or so, but I don't give you all the text behind it or the words, but I could put on a, one of these for those that would be interested. And I can tell you about what's in those slides. But going back to your question, is they had a metal gate PMOS process. We're talking silicon gate and MOS process. They didn't have any process. So we had to bring up the whole thing. That's what Terry Holt, and if you go to team6502.org, you'll get a whole lot of information about what they did and how we did it. It's amazing. It's one of a time. It's an experience that very few people go through that we're going to start off with the whole thing. We had to do the whole thing. And that meant that we weren't going to waste their time with an enhancement load transistors. We we're going to do depletion load. And that's what I knew we needed to do when I was still working on the PIA at Motorola. And so 
I knew what we wanted to do. Chuck knew what we wanted to do. And Chuck, Chuck, by the way, started at Motorola two years after I started at Motorola. I started June 14th, 1971. He came along in 1973. We're out of there in 1974. Seems to me, Chuck probably had the idea of let's raid the second largest semiconductor company in the world's microprocessor team. And he got the best guys out of them. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, if I can summarize this, um, unlike the model where you have at the moment where you sort of think, oh, there's sort of one existing high-end technology that everybody used, um, you folks at MOS more or less designed your own. I mean, you know, it was incremental over the existing stuff, but in particular, um, oh, I'm sorry, it was the it was the depletion mode loads that was the right. that were part of the magic. So right. the the short version of all of this is that uh, the 6502, both the microarchitecture, the configuration of the transistors, and the process technology were right. both pretty revolutionary for the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Intel didn't have any that I'm aware of. They might have had something in development. And, sure. uh, and Motorola didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. By the way, since we're running out of time, I think, yeah. here is another thing that state of the art. This is what the professors would be working with their students with. That little black chip here is an Intel FPGA Max 10. You can see all these on my website if you want to actually get a better picture. But this, this right here is actually manufactured. So Intel is a fabulous semiconductor company for FPGAs. <laughs> so in other words, I was the first fabulous semiconductor company because Bob Jones of NCR in, in uh, Fort Collins, uh, he came to a second source meeting with an answer of no. And that's when Wozniak and I look at each other, well, wait a second, Bob. Why would you come to a second source meeting with an answer of you're not going to be a second source, even though you're a second source for the 65 CO2? And I'm like, I can't believe you'd come to it. You knew what the meeting was about. So Des Sheehan, who was at GTE, he was vice president of uh, what, uh, oh, GTE Semiconductor. Uh, that's who I designed the 65 CO2 for first. Anyhow, but the point I'm making here is that our technology is an FPGA, state-of-the-art, and then we can convert them to things like this. This is a, I think a 200 millimeter wafer. And what you do with this is you put it on glass and then you pull it off and you have a whole bunch of plastic 65 CO2s same instruction set that's used in the Apple IIc and Apple IIe, right there, plastic. <laughs> We're gonna have classes on that too. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so that's a nice segue into a few other uh, questions that we had uh, posted. Um, one fellow asked, why is it difficult to get cores for the FPGA? Um, not all cores available for emulation yet. And broadly, the question is, you know, how do they get sold and so forth? I assume you license FPGA cores to a, a number of folks. No, we'll actually, we'll sell you the FPGA with it in. And uh, one of the things about these chips, they have a 64-bit unique ID. That means every one of the Altera Max 10s comes off the production line with a unique ID. This was something the, the publisher, the owner of Byte Magazine came to me one day, visited me in my office, wanted to do that with the 816. Before it was manufactured, he wanted to put a unique code on it. And everybody he talked to said, no, you don't wanna do that because then you'd be able to identify the computer that it was. And then you would lose, you would lose, you would, people would know who you are. And they didn't want that. So then I didn't do that. But at the same time, I wasn't going to do it anyway, even though we had. But this has unique code. So every one of these we can find if we want them. Now, coming back to it, it also, we have every, all of our IP is encrypted. So we can actually give you the file so you can instantiate this in your own thing. Now, what I'm doing with this class that I'm going to, I'm preparing 
is not only making all of the views available for my GDS2 for the design flow, but all of my information available for my RTL. So you'll be able to build one of these from the source code yourself. But unfortunately, those that are listening, you'll have to find a professor like Stephen Edwards and take a class from him, and then you can do this. <laughs> Please, no, I, my enrollments are already already nuts. Um, <laughs> this is a nice segue on to uh, another question that we have here. Um, somebody was asking, where's my 32-bit 6502? It's called an arm. It's called a wrist. Uh, Stephen Edwards got his PhD from Berkeley. Berkeley has a great team there that's behind the risk five. Hey, look, it's not a, look, look at everybody there at the Apple uh, Kansas Fest, right? Um, you guys are all programming those boxes and you don't want to give up the Apple II. I don't want you to give up the Apple II. What I like to think, figure out is how we can plug one of these into your Apple II and run at, ready for this? 10 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, and plugs into the O2 socket. Now, if you want to make that 32 bits at 10 gigahertz, why don't we make it 64 bit? Because we can go through 64 bits as fast as these other guys can. So in other words, the architecture of the 6502 always was what I have defined as addressable register architecture, ARA. ARA means that you can get to the registers, make a 64-bit. Our floating point, WAS's floating point, if it's double precision, is 64-bit. So what happens is you can get the 64-bit registers in page zero as fast as the other guy you can get them on chip. And so that's what I'm saying. The architecture can do it. Do you want to do 256? We got that too. But it's the 6502, just run a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in first in line for one of those, definitely. Hey, that's the project we're going to work on. Yep, Steven. must be, definitely. Uh, let's see. So we wanted to end on a, a question. We're, we're already over time, but these have been great questions and, and discussions and so forth. Um, you were asking, what's next? You know, how, how, do we, how do we keep this marvelous thing going? And in particular, you know, Waz's legacy and the marvelous design of the Apple II that we're sort of all here for. Right, right. And, and so when are we gonna hold Apple accountable? You can't say Apple II forever and then unplug it. Now, unless you're gonna say, we're gonna pray for Apple II forever. Uh, well, that's a way of looking at it, but let's get real. Let's get very real. Let's hold Apple accountable to the educators of the world. The educators of the world, I know them. I know one is on this, this Zoom call. That there's information associated with the Apple II, and that's why I'm making everything available to education. It's not for commercial, it's education. And so what I'm doing there is saying, Apple, come back to the Apple II and tell me what you need to make that important to the world. There's a professor at Michigan that has a blog site called something along the lines, if you Google this, you'll find it. It's computer science was meant to be taught to everyone, just like reading, writing, arithmetic. There's a blog site for that. And so what I'm saying, Apple, if you're listening, Apple II forever means Apple II forever. I have an article in 1984 when you were introducing the Apple IIc and the last paragraph really upset some people at Apple because I'm saying you could do a notebook style computer with the CMOS technology that I have right now for education. Why don't you step up to the plate and be the company you used to be associated with the Apple II? Now, what I, the reason why I wanted to talk about App Wozniak, I have never said this before. But if you look at the, now there's a little bit of, of emotion in my voice right now. If you look at the team 64, or six, see, team 6502.org, you'll see that that celebrates Steve Wozniak. If we played that video, it would be just absolutely awesome. But what happens here is 
Wozniak is the one that changed the freaking world and watch that video. And if you don't agree, then tell me who it is. And so Wozniak came back to Apple. He was doing something, but I think he always was an employee. He was getting paid the whole time. I think he still gets paid. But the point is, he doesn't need to work. But when he came back to Apple to do the Apple II GS, that's why, that's why he was in the second source meeting. Why was he in the That's the only meeting I've ever had with Wozniak. And I wanted to tell you, thank you, Woz. And the thank you comes in the form of the team6502.org video. Jennifer did that. Jennifer is the voice over. We know what we're talking about, Woz. You know what we're talking about. You get fees for talking to people. And I think your wife uh, might, wants to make sure you, she sees you or whatever. So you could probably travel all over the world talking because you're famous. And I'm saying thank you. That was good. Good. Uh, Berger, Becky uh, uh, writes, and I agree, uh, Apple computer should open source all the Apple II source schematics, ROMs, things like that. Everything's available, but of course, it's still questionable uh, copyright stuff. I, I don't think you'll find much disagreement there. Well, but the point is, here's the point. We got the most valuable comp com company in the world. They went through $3 trillion. Mm -hmm. Just find out how many people from the past that actually knows the Apple II and why they love it. Those, oh, those slots that Wozniak designed, they're important. So what I'm saying, unless Apple, now, Ask Commodore to do a Commodore 64. Commodore's not around. Ask Atari. I don't think Atari's around. Ask all of these people that, you know, BBC, uh, the B, they're not around. Acorn, I don't think they're around. So who's, who's left holding the bag? Apple. Unless Apple sells it, it's just called another home project. I got a lot of home projects. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one, this one, this is gonna be used by people. And then we plug in this, we plug in this education board into it. I can do that. Hey, I can do a lot of boards. I got a lot of boards. I got all kinds of boards. Here's the one with this one. You can buy this one uh, for six, I think $6502. Anyhow, but that is an Apple. Apple has to do it. And I think Waz needs to do it. And I think the reason why you do it, because every person on the planet should know something about computer science. And I would add something about the 6502. But if it isn't sold by Apple, it ain't gonna happen. It's just a bunch of projects, sell a few thousand, I'm happy. There, you know, there's a lot, you can find them, a lot of them, 6502.org collects how many people have done them. They got a lot of projects. And it's wonderful that people do that. But the education of humanity has to happen by Apple. They started the project, let's finish it. So that what I'm saying is, what I said yesterday, Stephen, to you is, I don't think it's gonna happen unless Stephen's involved with it. But I'm gonna find a way of doing it. I'm gonna find a way of doing it. I'm gonna find a way because Apple, Apple is actually funding indigenous education for STEM. Check out Alabama a and We're looking at a tape out class with them. But Apple has their own ways of doing things. And they're, I think they're blocking me from a Alabama a and They don't have to. We're on, the same, we're on the same path. But I'm saying, unless Apple comes back with an Apple II that's updated to 21st century for the masses, it's because they learn about how their most advanced two gigahertz processors work at what 64 bit, whatever it is in the iOS and the new Macintosh and all of these things. Hey, that's ARM, that's my friend. They're using my friend. They're using the same model. But let's go back to the Apple II. Let's just do it right. Let's finish the game. Apple II forever. Yep, absolutely. Somebody ought to point out uh, how much money uh, Nintendo and a few other uh, the companies have made by selling, uh, you know, retro consoles and, and, and so forth. So absolutely. Yeah. Let's see. I think we're wickedly out of time here. 
Um, but I think the plan is to continue the discussion on, on Discord. Bill, did you ever uh, manage to, it's fussy to get there, but it, you, you can get there. Oh, we want to continue this on Discord. Sure, if I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, all right. All right, well, it's been fun. I, I didn't check any of the questions, and so I was, I was responding. Yeah, there's, to uh, there are a few other uh, highly technical ones that we just haven't gotten a chance to, to get to, unfortunately. But uh, it, you know, if, it, it, do, do, does everybody do they have my email? Because send me an email. I'm I'm happy to respond an email. Just happy. So any of the questions, just throw, take the whole thing and throw it in an email and send it to me. Yep, that sounds good. Good to me. He's he's pretty easy to Google. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we, we're, we're going to leave this and join up on Discord. Yep. Yep. That sounds okay. good. All righty. Well, it's been fun. I hope it's been fun for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>